<laughs> okay, I'm mean, gonna start this lecture. Uh, I didn't even remember what I say in the intro. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so, and I, oh, I want to talk about the final paper assignment. Well, I guess one of the reasons I totally ran out of time in the class I was just in is because I also started talk, by talking about the final paper assignment. So I'll try to make this quick. <laughs> um, so the paper, so it's six to eight pages long. That's a little bit long for a, for, for a paper for one quarter course, I guess, but this is supposed to be a disciplinary communication course. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, uh, so it's due on uh, Wednesday, June 14th, but um, an introductory paragraph and brief outline is due um, a week from today, June 1st. So like, and you don't have to use that introductory paragraph or follow that outline in the paper, but, uh, but the idea is that, and this is my, my feeble attempt to make this a disciplinary communication course, basically. The idea is that you hand that in and then um, the TAs are gonna set up special meetings where you can get feedback from TAs and fellow students who also show up for meetings. Um, so, um, and so like, if you if you do end up going with something along the lines of what you hand in, then hopefully that will be helpful in making the paper better. Uh, um, I used to try to have the so this is something I'm talking about. What I used to do and I don't. Do. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, right. So that so so this is quite different than the first two writing assignments. The first two writing assignments are basically like a really structured exercise. This is actually a paper. So you, you like have to come up with an idea of what you want to show and you know develop your evidence, whatever. Um, there are these suggested topics. Um, you don't have to write about one of these topics. Usually almost everyone does, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, each of these topics is pretty broad in the sense that they include lots of sub questions and like branching, you know, suggestions. That that's how you should read those the, the those many questions, right? It's not like they write on this topic, answer all the following questions. So that like questions are supposed to lead into different directions, where you, different ways you could think about it. Um, um, I'm. Uh, strongly recommending that you write about at, at least in, at least two of the different people we read. So like a comparison paper. I think it's easier to write a good comparison paper than it is to write, right? Like it's easier to write a good paper about how is Hume different from Locke, you know, or whatever, than it is to write a good paper about what does Hume mean. Yeah. <laughs> So that's why I'm recommending that. The truth is, I usually do that myself. If you look at those titles of my <laughs> right. So, um, and uh, please don't plagiarize. Please don't have Chat GPT write your paper. Um, and um, and this it's supposed to be an interpretive paper. So meaning like try to focus on trying to understand what the authors mean. Not for example, on deciding whether they're right or not, or which one is better. Um, um, there's, as I hope you can tell by like what I do in lecture over and over, <laughs> there's a lot to be said about what they mean. And it's not easy to say, and it's perfectly easy to have an original thesis about that without at all getting into the question of 
what's actually true of the world, right? Like, does it really exist? And what, yeah. Again, I think to write a good paper where the thesis is the world exists, Barclay is wrong, is a lot harder than to write a good paper about this is what Barclay means. <laughs> so, um, uh, and whatever, I'm not requiring any specific like format for footnotes or um, separate bibliography or whatever. You can do those things if you want, I guess. Are there questions about any of this? Okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start right in where I left off last time. Um, trying to, uh, or going through Hume's explanation for why we come to believe in the independent and continuous existence of the objects of our senses, which for the vulgar means, right? So this is the vulgar view, which means the common view. And, um, and remember, he says that this is what philosophers believe almost all the time too, when they're not thinking about it. So the vulgar view is that the, um, the very things that are present to our mind, that is the impressions, are the external objects. So it means that like, here's the mind, here's an impression. So like, first of all, you know, assume I just keep having this impression. So like I'm staring at this table. <laughs> so like, this is the table. It's in my mind or it's immediately present to my mind. But so it's like what Locke would call an idea or what Barclay would call an idea, but it also is the table. Okay, and so, so far that's the same as what Barclay thinks is common sense, what the common people believe. Um, only Hume adds this, he says, and they also think that like, suppose I'm staring at the table and then I turn around and then I turn back around. So there was a time when I didn't have that impression or you know, a set of impressions or whatever, series impressions. Um, there was a time when I didn't have it. And then I started to have, well, so like Hume says, what really happens is I have the impression and then I don't have it. And then I have, like, then I have a sim an exactly similar one. But these are not the same impression because how can they be the same? They're, they're like something else happened in between, <laughs> right? So nothing can happen between something and itself. <laughs> so they're not the same, but uh, but the vulgar come to believe that the impression did still exist. It just wasn't present to my mind. So this is what the when the vulgar believe in the independent and continuous existence of the objects of the senses, what that means is they believe that the very impressions that are immediately present to my mind can like um, continue to exist even when they're not present to my mind and then they can come back. And so the beginning is an explanation of, so why do we start to form, why do we, why we are we irresistibly trying to believe this, right? So that even when we're philosophers and we realize that this can't be true, and I haven't said why we realize this can't be true, but even after we realize this can't be true, as soon as we stop thinking about that reason, we go right back to believing it. There, there must be some really strong process that leads to this belief. So he says, um, there's two parts to his explanation. So like the one I talked about last time was 
that um, um, these impressions that we regard as external have a kind of regularity to them, but it's only a partial regularity. And we can make it a full regularity by inventing this thing. Right, like, so, you know, so for example, if um, sometimes when I see a door open, or sometimes when I hear a door open, I also see a door open. And then there's the sound, right? The audible delight. <laughs> sometimes when I have the audible door, I also have a visible door. Other times, there's an audible door and no visible door. Right? So that's not a full regularity. But suppose I um, can tell a consistent story about what the visible door is doing, even though it's not present in my mind, in such a way that there's always a visible door whenever there's an audible door. It's just that sometimes. The visible door isn't present in my mind. Then I can make it a full regular, right? So the way that works is that, like, you know, if I'm looking at the door and there's an audible door, there also is a visible door. But if I'm not looking at the door, there's an audible door. And I say, there still is a visible door too. I just don't see it. <laughs> so it's an assumption. Well, it's, I mean, um, it's, uh, it's something I believe that I, that I don't have an argument showing that it's true. So I guess you could go out an assumption, right? But it's not something I consciously assume. On the con right on the contrary, this happens without my realizing why it happened. Right, it, it first happened a long time ago when I was a baby. I don't remember. Right? So, um, right. So I come. So I come to believe that, or if I can come to believe that there's a visible door sometimes when I don't see it, then these regularities can be made complete. But then his question was, okay, but what makes us believe it? I mean, like we would like to believe it because it would make the regularities complete. But just because you would be nice to believe something doesn't make you believe it necessarily. What makes us believe it? And so and for that, we need to we need to explain um, why. When we have the impression of the audible, I'm not going to draw this, but so there's an audible door impression. And then, like, um, to explain how we come to believe there's a visible door that we don't see, we have to explain two things. First of all, why do we get a visible door idea? And then second of all, where does the visible door idea get its vivaciousness? <laughs> right? So, um, because if we have this idea and it's vivacious, that means we believe that there's a Visible door, because <laughs> that's what belief is. Apparently. So, um, so he says, like this looks like it looks almost the same as the beliefs we form based on cause and effect. Feel like there might be some problem. I mean, maybe partly because 
maybe I'm trying to match this up with what he says about cause and effect in the inquiry, and maybe it's not quite the same as what he says in the treatise. Or maybe he's fixed it up in the inquiry to make it more, I don't know. But in any case, so like this is what he says. He says, in reasoning from cause and effect, we, you know, we come to associate A strongly with B because every time we see A, we later see B. So now we get A. Um, so B is strongly associated with A, so we get the idea of B. And it gets its vivaciousness from A, so we believe B. Meaning, although this is, I think, the part that uh, Kant will ask tough questions about, meaning we believe B will happen. So this right, this somehow the vivaciousness attached to this idea makes it the expectation of B. Not like the belief that B already happened or that it's happening now or something. We expect B. And I think then you have to add, and sure enough, B happens, right? So our expectation is um, fulfilled. And right, and so like in the um, good case of cause and effect, the regularity that we expect is exactly the regularity that we see. Right? We, after this happens for a while, we always expect B after A, and sure enough, B always happens after A. Now, like, I mean, how to fit this in with the things that cause, the cases of cause and effect where it's like, the cause is remote and the effect is is perceived. I mean, where let's say where the cause is something I'm never going to see the cause. The cause happened was a long time ago, or I'm not sure exactly how to fit that in with this. That's what I was worrying about before. But in any case, this is like the this is like the simple case. And then of course, like maybe the regularity isn't a hundred percent. Right? Maybe like one out of 10 times you get an A and there's no B. So then we come to expect B with like 90% probability. And we continue seeing B with 90% probability. So again, we expect exactly the regularity that we see. Right? But Hume says this case is not like that. Because in this case, Right? There's many exceptions to the rule that when that um, when I hear the audible door, I see the visible door. How many exceptions are there? Well, like um, um, exactly as many as I'm trying to fill in using this association. Hey, so like. I was trying to explain the last time, like suppose that half the time when I hear a door opening, I also see it open. Right? So that would be like, um, so now the arrows, or maybe I'll draw without an arrow. It's not a sequence in time. It's like what happens at the same time, right? So like half the time I have A with B and half the time I have A without B. So forth, right? So now um, I'm supposed to. Um, so, like, how strongly do I associate B with A? Well, 50%, you would think, right? But now the association is supposed to make me always believe that there's B. So it's going to make me believe B with 100% probability, right? Because now every time I hear a door opening, I'll believe that there is that there is a visible door opening, too. only just sometimes I'm not seeing it, right? So somehow out of the 50% association, I got 100% belief. 
right? And that's why Cube says that this isn't the regular process of learning that cause and effect. Right, this is on page uh oops, I didn't write down what page was in the text. Okay, one minute seconds. On page two forty eight. Um, um Book one, part four, section two. Um, it is not only impossible, oops, it is not only impossible that any, I guess, yeah, it's 248, it's sorry. It is not only impossible that any habit should ever be acquired otherwise than by the regular succession of these perceptions. Um, but also that any habit should ever exceed that degree of regularity. Any degree, therefore, of regularity in our perceptions can never be a foundation for us to infer a greater degree of regularity in some objects which are not perceived. Right, so again, like from the fact that half the time when we hear a door open, we also see a door open, we, there's no way we can infer that an audible door opening is always accompanied by a visible door opening. So why do we go ahead and do this? Well, he says, like, one reason is that the mind, like, once it gets underway, tends to continue farther in a certain direction. I think he doesn't fill in the details here, but I think what he's thinking is something like this, that we learn that we can improve these regularities by like observing more carefully. Right, like, so for example, I can carry a mirror around. <laughs> so like, um, even when I'm not facing the door, I can see it in a mirror. And if I do that, I'll improve the regularity, right? Now there'll be more times when I see the door open. Um, I can pay more careful attention. I can use instruments. I can, you know, whatever. Various things I can do that count as observing better or more carefully tend to increase this regularity. And so I mind invents a fiction of like, completely observing everything and then the irregularity becoming perfect. Um, as I said, like you know, most of that is, is not explicit in Q, but I but I'm trying to fill in what it is that like what's the direction that we start out going <laughs> that we end. But he says that's part of the explanation, but he fears that the entire edifice of our belief in the external world is is too much to be born just by that one principle. So I just think of that. So this is where the second factor comes in. Now, I mean, as I said, I think to begin with last time. I'm not sure how these two are supposed to go together. The, the second thing seems like a complete explanation in itself for why we come to believe this. Only, of course, it, it can't be because we only form this belief in the case of the impressions that we call external, right? Like we don't, at least according to Hume, don't come to believe that um, if I felt angry in the morning and then in between I didn't feel angry and then in the evening I feel an exactly similar feel, feeling of anger, we don't come to believe that the anger existed in between and I just wasn't perceiving. 
Now, I mean, like maybe we do have a tendency to believe that now. Right, right, like Torch Freud and whatever. Like maybe we do have a tendency to believe that now. But I don't think that goes against Hume's explanation because I think that would, to the extent that we believe that, it's because, again, we think we can like complete a certain regularity by assuming that or believing that the anger is there even when we don't perceive it. And anyway, be as it may, so Hume says we don't believe this about all of our impressions, only about the external impressions. And this is the explanation for why only the external impressions. But um, but the question is, why does this? I guess maybe the way they're supposed to fit together is this. No. I still don't understand. All right, but I'll just talk, start talking about what the other part of the explanation is. The other part of the explanation is that um, the mind tends to confuse um, relation and especially the relation of resemblance with identity. So Identity, remember, means sameness, being the same, right? It comes from the Latin word idem, which means same. <laughs> All right, well, the same. Uh, so, um, so we tend to confuse resemblance with identity, right? That is, we when two things resemble each other, we tend to think they're the same. As each other. So, what is identity, or like what is sameness? Now, I mean, I think you recall from Locke that there's a problem with identity because it seems to be a relation between a thing and itself. And if you think a relation always has to have two terms, then that doesn't make sense. And I think I said at the time, you know, well, can the thing kind of go out of itself and then get back to itself? And I said, yeah, that's Hegel's answer, <laughs> right? But it's not Locke's answer or Hume's answer. All right, so Locke's answer was um, that um, identity is a relation between two different things that we treat as the same for a certain purpose. Right, so like, and they're 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 things at different times, right? Identity is a relation between two things at different times. They're different things, I think. But this is not one hundred percent clear. Locke thinks two things at two different times are never the same thing, because there are two different times, <laughs> right? But like I said, that's not 100% clear, but certainly in most of the examples of identity that Locke talks about, um, well, no, I shouldn't draw one picture at this time. I was trying to draw So, um, drawing a little more, more in there. Um, right? So, like, you know, this tiny sapling is not the same thing as this huge oak tree. Obviously not. They're not the same size. They're not the same shape. They don't. This one may not contain any of the parcels of matter that were in this one. Right. So, um, but we treat them as the same um, for some purpose, and you know, um, we we treat them. So we know that they're they're related by some relation. Right in this case, it's the relation of like continuing life process. Um, so, um, but for certain purposes, we treat things that are related by that relation as the same. So we say this is the same oak tree as that oak tree. Shift the purposes, the relation will change, and our like what we say is the same or different will change. Right, so like if you ask, is this the same mass of matter as this? You say no. 
What's the same mass of matter as this? It's probably like scattered all over the place. Um, so, right, so this was Locke's answer. So Locke's answer is basically that, again, the question is like identity seems to be between two different things, but it seems to be a relation between two different things that are the same as each other. And that sounds like a contradiction. And Locke's answer is, it really is two different things. Um, but um, we, we treat them as the same as each other for some purpose. Hume's answer is like almost the opposite. So Hume's answer is, that in a case that's proper of something that's properly called identical, there really is just one thing. And so there are no terms for a relation. So why do we think there's a relation? Hume says we invent a fictitious relation. And this and this is why. So like if this is the time direct thing. Suppose I have something that continues without change. Let's see, yeah, I can't even draw it this way. Suppose we have something that continues without change, right? There's some impression in my mind and there's no change in it. So Hume says, I didn't get to talk about this, but you may remember back when Hume says, we, we get the idea of time only from a succession of changes. So since there's no change in this, we um, um, there's no impression of time passing. There's just one thing. And, and Hume says, like, if this were this one impression were the only thing in my mind, then there would be no time between one part of it and another. It doesn't have part. But the thing is that this one thing is simultaneous with things that are different from each other. So while I'm having this impression, I also have two other impressions that change. These are two different sounds, let's say. Right? So this impression is at the same time as this sound, and at the same time as this sound, but this sound is after this sound. That's why I was saying I can't just draw it on an axis like this, right? Jim is saying that in real life, simultaneity is not transitive, right? Like if A is simultaneous with B and B is simultaneous with C, it doesn't follow that A is simultaneous with C. So you can't like divide, you know, have like, this is one time, this is the next time, this is the next time. Like, time, bar, uh, time doesn't split up that in any way. <laughs> and that's exactly why we invent this fictitious relation of identity, because we start to believe, we, we, we pretend that this has parts corresponding to the, this, this sequence of things that are simultaneous with it. So even though there's only one thing, we pretend that there's two things, the one that's simultaneous with this and the one that's simultaneous with this. And then we invent the fictitious relation of identity between these two fictitious parts. <laughs> that's what identity, that's what identity strictly speaking is. Right? So whereas Locke solved it by saying, really identity is a relationship between different things. Um, and we just treat them as the same. Hume says, really, there's just one thing, it's the same, there's no relation, but we um, pretend that it has two parts that are related to each other. So that's identity. And then Hume says, we tend to confuse that situation with another situation. Right, so here's the situation of identity. Here's the situation of resemblance. 
<laughs> this one is very slightly different from this one, <laughs> right? It resembles it strongly. It might actually, I mean, as we'll see, it might even resemble it exactly, but let's start with, with this. It resembles it strongly. So, um, so now there's two different times. There's, you know, there's the time with this and this sound, and there's the time with this and this sound. Um, um, but the mind's feeling in this case is very similar to its feeling in this case. Right in this case, it um, went from this to this without having to spend any attention on changes in this because it didn't change. <laughs> in this case, it went from this to this without having to spend very much attention on the change from this to this because it barely changed. Or because it changed into something that resembled the original thing very closely. So now let's talk about the case where I'm where I'm facing the table and I turn around and then I'm facing the table again. But well, so we shouldn't draw this yet, right? So here's table one, and here's table two. Remember, this is still the vulgar view, so this impression is the table, right? So. Um, so it's, the table is not changing very much at all, not noticeably changing. Table one and table two, these two impressions exactly resemble each other. So if later I think back on this situation, I think Kim doesn't emphasize that, but I, I think that's what he's talking about. Later, I think back on this situation, I remember what happened here. So I have the idea of table one and the idea of table two. And they're two different ideas or they're ideas of two different tables, <laughs> um, but they exactly resemble each other. So when I go from one to the other in my memory, I don't feel any resistance at all. It's a very smooth transition from one to the other. It's almost exactly like having a single idea of a table that doesn't change. And again, this would be a case of identity when we start pretending that this has two different parts, <laughs> but it really only has one part. So um, this really does have two parts, but they're exactly the same as each other. And so I pass from one to the other um, with almost the same feeling. And so I start to confuse these things. And so, I mean, there's some question in my mind why it doesn't work, work both, both ways. Like the confusion should mean that I can't, you know, I can't focus on which it is. But instead, the confusion seems to be that I always go to identity. I'm not sure I understand why that is, but in any case, so like, um, so thinking back on this, I start to think there was just one table. But then, of course, if I pay attention to this gap, um, now there's no smooth transition, right? I go to the gap, and then I go to this one. So when I think back, so this is like when I was remembering these two impressions. But this is when I, like now when I'm going through the whole sequence of what happened, now I notice that um, there was an interruption between. So I'm not tempted to think there are that. So it's this is a contradiction which Hume says makes us uncomfortable. Right? We don't like to believe in contradiction. 
How do we resolve it? Well, we can resolve it by saying it was really just one table, only I didn't see it all. So that's where this part comes in. Right, so now the mind can pass easily through it again, thanks to this belief. Yeah. Um, so this, uh... Uh, so th 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 does Hume uh, th th not think that people's like ideas about their um, uh, about their impressions can be wrong? So like if people like if you if like so like if you don't see a difference between like 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 seemingly two um, like two different impressions of, of, of the same thing like if, like if you don't um, like if you don't think there's a difference like effectively there isn't there isn't one like that uh, what he thinks well. No, I mean, so like, first of all, most of all, most of the time when he talks about this, he says straight out that this is just a mistake, that there really are two different impressions. So he thinks they're wrong, right? Um, but it's, you know, I mean, it's a little complicated because, I mean, at least the way it first happens, it's not so much obviously wrong as groundless. Because according to Hume, as opposed to Barclay, there's nothing absurd about this, right? So Barclay would say that this invention of an impression or what Barclay would call an idea that like leaves my mind and comes back doesn't make any sense because an idea is, or what Hume's calling an impression is a mode of my mind and it can't exist anywhere else. But Hume says, you know, uh, impressions and ideas are things, and we can't see any necessary connection between them and each other. So a bunch of them happen to occur in certain relation to each other, and that's what I call my mind. But there's no reason they always have to be in that relation. And so it's perfectly consistent to think that the same impression, while remaining the, the same, its relation to other ideas and impressions changes. Right? And it changes in such a way that at this point it's in my mind, it counts as in my mind, but at this point it's not, and now it is again. Um, right, so this is what related to, to what Hume says uh, in this week's reading, that we have no idea of inhesion, right? Like we have no idea of the relationship of a mode or accident to the substance that it supposedly adheres to. All we know is that there's these ideas and impressions. We don't see any reason why one of them couldn't, like, so to speak, go away in some direction from the others and then come back. It's not a contradiction, it's not absurdity. So, like, this is something we can invent, it's something we can believe. And I think the point is, it gets it. Vivacity from um, it gets its vivacity from the actual impression. That's where the this so we but but where do we, why do we get the idea in the first place? We get the idea in the first place because of this process of. So no, I shouldn't draw the idea there. Yeah, and I shouldn't say this gets its vivacity. I mean, this is what we're believing happened. But oh, I don't know how to draw this. I, I don't think I can draw it, but let me just say it, right? That we start to believe that there was a table impression that we couldn't, but sort of, we start to imagine a table impression where we couldn't see it because that's the only way to resolve this contradiction. And once we start to imagine it, it draws vivacity from the impressions we did have. And so we start to believe it. Something like that, I think. I don't think Hume says exactly, he breaks down where the vivacity comes from. Um, but I, I think that's the way it works. And like I said, I don't know how to put it together with the other part. Why we don't do this with anger or pain or whatever, according to Hume. 
because they do resemble each other. So we should come to believe that they're the same, but somehow you also need that extra push from the fact that you're trying to increase the regularity. Um, all right, so that with some defects in my understanding is um, Hume's explanation of the vulgar, what the vulgar believe and how they come to believe it about the object of their senses. Um, so, and again, Hume says, not absurd, but he says, it's certainly false. How can you tell it's false? Well, so like, remember there are these two things, independent and continuous existence. So what the, the principles that Hume is discussing of the imagination here lead to the belief in, continu belief in continuous existence. That's where the, right, that's the like, immediate result. But then because continuous existence implies independent existence, we, we start to believe that it's independent, right? So we, we believe that ideas in general don't, or impressions in general don't depend on our mind. But he says, that's not true. Just do this, push one of your eyes, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, um, instead of one table, it, that is one table impression, but remember, we're, we're thinking the impression is the table, <laughs> right? So instead of one table impression, or instead of one table, there are two tables. And they, they look exactly the same as each other. So, um, according to the vulgar, they're independent existences. They're, they're both tables. Well, okay, I guess I should put it this way. It seems like both of these tables couldn't be independent of my mind. I mean, I, I guess you could start to believe that I actually make there be more of everything when I do this. That it's like cause and effect. And so it is independent of my mind, but my mind somehow like sends rays out to it and makes it double or whatever. Okay. Because independent of my mind doesn't mean my mind can't do something to it. Um, right? Like the chalk is independent of my mind, but I can still drop it. So, um, so you could start to believe something like that. I, I mean, we certainly don't. Um, not sure if Hume completely understands, explains why we don't. But in any case, you know, we don't believe that I don't believe that pressing my eyeball actually caused a new table to exist. So of these two tables, one of them at least is it is dependent on my mind. Yeah. Um, so is it basically going back to when you drew like the A and then to the B thing? Yeah. <laughs> Is it is that essentially what it is? Like I see this table, and so when I see this table, let's say let's say it's A or whatever, I'm immediately assuming that if there is this table A, then there is an, this table B. Like is it? Well, no, I don't. I mean, usually if there, when there's one table, right? Tables don't usually like multiply. <laughs> yeah. Right. It only happens. This is the. I mean, I, I think it's like somewhere in here is, is Hume's answer to the question I was raising. Like, why don't we believe that this actually causes another table to, right? Like, I mean, it would go against our usual experience of cause and effect. <laughs> so, um, right. So, um, so like when we, 
where we find that in this case, there's another table all of a sudden. We say, well, that's not because there actually is another table. It's because I'm seeing another table. Right? I'm seeing a table that isn't really there in addition to the table that is there. But then Hume says, wait, which one? Which one is the real one? And which one is the one that you're just seeing because you're pressing your eye? And they look exactly the same. So um, like um, if from like, if like effects are due to like causes, right? That is, if we use our usual method of reasoning from a, a cause and effect, then we should conclude that if one of these is dependent on my mind, so is the other. And that's just an example. He gives a lot of examples, right? Of how things look different colors from different points of view, or how things change, seem to change their size when you change your distance from them. And, Right, all these things are the are and like they're not like weird esoteric examples, right? They're which is exactly why he says even the slightest amount of philosophical reflection is enough to show you that this theory, although not absurd, is, is definitely false. It's not true that our impressions have an independent existence, and therefore it's not true that they have a continuous existence. So, um, at that point, when the philosopher notices that, and here a philosopher means someone who engages in even a slight amount of philosophical reflection, <laughs> um, if, when the philosopher notices that, their conclusion should be, oh, so this was a mistake. There's nothing in this picture has a continu has an independent existence, and therefore there's no nothing has a continuous uh, existence, right? So they should conclude they sh they, sh they should move to Barclay's well something like Barclay's view, and without the part about spirits, maybe anyway they they should move to something like Barclay's view, right? That the like um, when I turn around, you know, there's something present in my mind, call it a table or an impression, whatever you want. They turn around, there's no such thing. They turn back around, there's another one. <laughs> That's what they should conclude. But Hume says the force that's making us believe in a continuous existence is so strong that instead they say, Oh yeah, this doesn't have a continuous existence, but something else <laughs> has a continuous existence. Right? And this, now they say, this is a table impression. This is an impression of a table. And so is this. And this is the table. So they agree with the vulgar that the table has a continuous existence and independent existence. But now, in order to avoid the obvious falseness of the vulgar's theory, they say that that table is different from my table impression. That my table impressions represent it, and it causes that. Right? And now we're in Locke's picture, basically. Hume says, this is how we get to it. We get to it by first, like kind of unconsciously, automatically adopting the vulgar view. Then when we start to do philosophy, noticing that the vulgar view can't be right. But then rather than responding justly, um, which would lead us to the true philosophy, instead we we like try to keep the fiction going by 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 <laughs> In this case, doubling every table, <laughs> right? So now every table, in addition, has a double existence: table impression and table itself, idea and object. So this is like uh, not a good reason to believe something. <laughs> 
right? Like Hume said, the, the only force that the, the philosophical view, all the philosophical view force, views force comes from the vulgar view. If we didn't first have the vulgar view, we would never invent another table outside, outside our mind that our impressions represent. We only do that because we followed the vulgar view until we realized it was false. So since we only believe the vulgar view in the first place because of this confusion between identity and resemblance, um, uh, it obviously doesn't give us a good reason to believe the philosophical. So, this, so, so right there, you have skepticism about our senses, right? Although, again, it's not actually a, the senses, but the imagination that are involved in doing this. But skepticism about what we ordinarily think of as the things we know by way of our senses, right? Like what not Locke calls sensitive knowledge. You know, I know there's a table there because I see it. And by that, I mean, if I'm a philosopher, I know that in addition to my table impression, there's, a, there's an object of my impression out there, and that's the table. So, um, and we've just said, there's no good reason to believe that. So it's skepticism. At this point, Hume says, this, this is where Hume says, Wow, I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't believe there's a table. But he says, but you will again, don't worry. <laughs> right? And as I pointed out, sure enough, Hume himself, in other parts of the book, when he's not discussing this issue, goes straight back to the philosophical view. Um, or to something like the philosophical view, anyway. I guess it's it's not the same because the the primary secondary quality distinction does not does not last. So there's like there's some result of this somehow, right? That I mean, he thinks that our colored um, ideas represent colored objects. Um, that is, that's what he believes when he's not thinking about this. When he's thinking about this, he's forced to say, there's no good reason to think there's such a thing as an object. It's my idea. All right. Um, so, like, that's the main, this is all stuff that I should have talked about last time. <laughs> that, that's, th this is section two of part four, book one. Skepticism with respect to the sentence. With regard to the central or Then in section three and four. So actually, before I go on, other questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask: Is it wrong of me to notice like a a relation between this and uh, it's a part in part two, section five, where it's talking about the the vacuums? And there's a line here. That, is it okay if I just read the sure? Uh, uh, since a body interposed betwixt two things may be supposed to be annihilated without producing any change upon such as lie on each hand of it, it's easily conceived how it may be created anew and yet produces little alteration. Now the motion of a body has much the same effect as its creation. I don't know if that's a sense of it, but, uh, The distant bodies are no more affected in the one case than in the other. This suffices to satisfy the imagination and proves there is no repugnance in such a motion. Afterwards, experience comes into play to persuade us that two bodies situated in the manner above described have really such a capacity of receiving body between them, and that there is no obstacle to the conversion of the invisible and intangible di distance into one that is visible and tangible. Uh, however natural that conversion may seem, we cannot be sure it is practicable before we have had experience of it. Uh, just mainly on that part about the just being as easy to, to imagine a visible and tangible a body betwixt them as there is the invisible and intangible. Um, hmm. So it's not the same thing, but I but I think right, it's not the same thing because this direction is time, not space. Right? So um 
but is it related? Um, yeah, I guess in the sense that um, so let's suppose I didn't see anything, right? So like instead of turning around, I close my eyes and I close them so I mean you can't really do this. And I close them so well that I, that I don't see any complete darkness. So, um, so uh, and then I open them again. Um, so this was in in time one of those invisible, um, simple distances, a, a, a time vacuum. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and yet, I can imagine a table. Yeah. You know, can imagine a table continuing to be there. Now, I mean, I don't know, like, um, So it's certainly yeah, it's definitely related somehow, but that's that's the most I could say, right? It, I, again, it's not the same. Like you can't, the table doesn't move in and out of this space because this is a this is a space in time, right? So things can't move in and out of it. Um, so like I'm not sure exactly how it's related, but yes, I think somehow the capacity to imagine this this interval filled in by table is the same as the capacity to imagine the invisible dis the, the uh, invisible distance filled in by a body. And maybe that's important, but I don't know. Um, okay. Um, right, are there other questions about this? Because otherwise we're gonna talk about the ancient philosophy and the modern philosophy. Right, so we have the vulgar view, and then we have the philosophical view, which I just talked about in general. So I think this might be a little bit different from what I said before, and I'm not sure which is right. But that at this point, the philo see the reason this is bad is well, never mind, like that. But at this point, at least it seems like the philosophical view is groundless. Um, but like that's all that's wrong with it. Um, but then he goes to on to discuss the two versions of it. But now I guess I mean he doesn't claim these are the only only two possible versions of it. Um, But um, but maybe he does kind of think that these are the these are the only two directions you can go. So the first is the ancient philosophy. So the ancient philosophy is basically like Aristotelian, or as he says, peripatetic. Right? Per the peripatetic school is Aristotle's school because Aristotle, at least, I don't know if we're sure this is the real explanation, but. <laughs> Um, but the people say it's because Aristotle used to teach while he was like walking around in the garden with Aristotle he was walking around, right? So, um, whereas the modern philosophy is basically locked. You know, the things he says don't really agree with Locke, but it's it's basically locked. It's closer to Locke than it is to Descartes, for example. Um, and, you know, what he shows in the case of the ancient philosophy is that in order to fill in, like, the details of what this external object is, we basically um, just let our imagination run wild. Um, so, like he compares the ancient philosophy to um, dreaming, 
right? He says, like, if we look at the details of the ancient philosophy, we can learn a lot about human nature when it's like, if the imagination is completely unrestrained and we let it, you know, go for any confusion it wants, um, we'll learn a lot about human nature just as, according to certain moralists, you can learn a lot about your character by observing what you do in a dream. Right, because like in the dream that you, I don't know, is this really true? But anyway, they say in a dream you act without any restraint, so you can see like what your what your true character is. Similarly, Hume says like in this kind of ancient philosophy dream, you can see what the human imagination would do if it was completely uncontrolled. But um, of course, that means that. Like whatever beliefs come up here are, are delusions, right? I mean, so like it's not just that there's no ground for believing them, but that that we got to these beliefs by specifically the process of like dreaming and, and self delusion. <laughs> um. And um, whereas in the case of the mock, so, so this is like, this turns out to be a dream. This turns out to be incoherent, self contradictory. Um, Talk about this I'm going to talk about it after, after if I have time. What I want to talk, what I want, what I'm trying to decide whether to talk about is the advantages of moderate skepticism as opposed to dogmatism, according to him, and what that means. So let me talk about these two first, then hopefully I'll have time to talk about that afterwards. So, right, so the ancient philosophy, um, um, I'm not gonna go into too much. I mean, we haven't discussed like Aristotelian, metaphysics very much in this course. So, um, and Hume is dealing with a kind of weird version of it. I'm not sure like exactly where his terminology comes from. It's a little bit non-standard, but um, um, the basic idea of the ancient philosophy is that what the external object is, is a substance. The substance is composed of matter and substantial form. And then the substance has various changing accidents, or at least potentially changing accidents, right? So like the table maybe is a bad example because it's an artificial thing which causes all kinds of problems. But like the usual example is Socrates, you know. So Socrates consists, first of all, of prime matter, which is the same for all. You know, so Socrates has an intellectual soul. So maybe, yeah, you know, let me use Bucephalus. Okay. This is Bucephalus, Alexander the Great's voice. That means cow head. Um, apparently he had a mark on his head that looked like a cow. Anyway, this so this is Bucephalus. So like 
So Bucephalus is composed, first of all, of matter, which is the same, like all bodies have the same matter. And second of all, of a form, and the form is the form of the species horse. Right, so like this is where the, the form is, is specific. So there's this generic matter that that all, um, at least material substances have in common. Um, and then there's the form that makes Bucephalus the particular type of thing that he is, namely a horse. But of course, like a horse is, no, sorry. Uh, but of course, Bucephalus is like also different from other horses. Not in the same place, not the same color, not the same size, whatever. And that's and also Bucephalus um, changes and remains the same thing, right? So like Bucephalus moves from one place to another. Bucephalus like hair might change color as he gets older, etc. Right? So Bucephalus is, um, remains. Um, exactly the same thing, even though he has um, lots of different properties and changing properties. The thing he always remains is, is given by his substantial form if he's a horse, but <laughs> the, all those other properties are accidents. Um, so, like the, the, what I've just basically talked about was is kind of the two roles of substance in Aristotelian philosophy. It's it's first of all like the subject of predication, <laughs> and there's actually two steps to that, which 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 Hume goes through accurately. Although again, the terminology is a little weird, but like first of all, there's the essential predication where we say what kind of thing this is, and that's explained by the composition of the substantial form and matter. So in some sense, the ultimate subject of predication is matter. That causes problems, but never mind. Um, but then, like everything else, every kind of like additional property something has that isn't essential to it is predicated of the substance, right? So, like, what is big? Bucephalus is big. <laughs> that is, this horse is big. You know, what is Bucephalus? I saw an ancient picture of Bucephalus where he was brown, but then it can't say he was black, so I don't know. But anyway, Bucephalus is black, so like, um, what is black? This horse is black, predicated of the substance. Subject of predication, and it's also the substrate of change. So if Bucephalus, like, you know, when Bucephalus was first born, Bucephalus was just a cute little bull. And then later, Bucephalus got bigger. So, you know, you might say, this is impossible because the big cannot be small. So the small cannot be big, right? So the small cannot receive bigness. So the small can never become big and all change is impossible, right? And um, Aristotle trying to head off that conclusion says, well, know that the, the substance that was small can receive bigness, right? It's by having that distinction between the substance and the actor that we're able to avoid the paradox. 
It's not the smallness itself that receives bigness. That's impossible. It's or another way of putting it is this thing is not essentially small. What it is is a horse. It has the property, the accident of smallness. The accident goes away and another accident. But it remains the same thing, a horse. So Hume says that like both of these things, and he explains some other stuff about Aristotelian philosophy, which I won't get into, but I think this is the important part. He says both of these things arise from an irregular or like delusional, like mad version of the principle that you, that makes us believe in the existence of external objects in the first place. Namely, confusion of relation with identity. Right? So in this case, we have a whole bunch of different properties that we associate strongly with each other. And in this case, the, the effect of the association is not going to be to get us to expect one that's not there or something like that. It's the effect of the association is that it's easy for the mind to go from one to the other to the point where it starts to not notice the difference between the different properties. And think they're all the same. There's just one property. Right, so the relation, I guess, is the relation of contiguity in space and time. Um, right, they, the properties always come together. So um, that I, I confuse that relation with identity. They start to think there's only one property. But then, of course, if I like, if I stop and consider them one by one, I see that they're different properties. Right, bigness is not the same as blackness, etc. Right. So how do I resolve the contradiction? I invent um, uh, something simple that um, all these properties really are. <laughs> right? That is what's really there is one thing. And I perceive it through these multiple accidents that I have, these multiple properties that inhere it. So it's a, it's it's just like the, what gave rise to the modern philosophy in the first place. You know, there was two things that I wanted to uh, to um, regard as both the same and different. So I just like split them up, <laughs> kept the old one different, and invented a new one that's the same. The same thing is happening with the multiple properties of Bucephalus here. Right? I'm like regarding them as um, all separate. But since my mind wants to think that there's just one thing there, like one simple idea rather than a whole bunch of ideas, I invent some other thing that's simple and say that they inhere in it. And similarly, in this case, this, this case is, I think, is easier to understand. It's just like because Bucephalus changes gradually, when I when I think of the process little by little, um, I tend to confuse it with identity. But when I look at when I compare the two ends, I see they're not the same at all. And so again, I invent something that stayed the same the whole time while the accidents change. So that's basically, Hume says, that's the source of Aristotelian metaphysics. It's nothing but letting your imagination invent whatever fantasies it wants. And if you say, well, you know, Hume, um, you just said that this is the same principle that makes us believe in external objects, for example. 
We don't try to stop believing that. That would be fruitless, as you yourself said. We don't try to stop believing that. Why should we believe this too? So Hume says that, you know, this is a regular constant principle that we rely on all our lives, that, you know, is necessary for human life, whatever. These are like weak, irregular principles that we can easily restrain ourselves from following and that aren't really useful. On the contrary, they tend to scare and confuse us. Right, and he compares it to like the difference between um, when I hear a voice in the dark, believing that there's someone there, like speaking, versus being in the dark and believing that there are demons. Right, he says one is that the first case is that regular constant. Um, principle of the imagination, and even though it's you no, know, it's leading us astray. Basically, still, uh, it's we. That is, we know when we stop and do this philosophical analysis that it's somehow leading us astray. As soon as we stop thinking about that, we we have to rely on it again. Whereas the other thing about the demons, you don't have to believe that. Try not to. <laughs> right. So. So, so that, you know, so therefore ancient philosophy, all right, that's the moral. Now, what about the modern philosophy? Um, right, so the modern philosophy is basically, is it, right, it's, I said it's closest to lock, it's some version of mechanism, right, that, that it, it says that, what properties does this external object, the table, have? It has primary qualities, right? Size, extension, figure, I mean, extension, size, figure, motion, and solidity. Um, Hume doesn't list extension and size separately because I just, he thinks they're the same thing actually. But in any case, um, and but it doesn't have, for example, color, right? So like if the, if the table looks brown, the brownness is a property of my impression, not of the table itself. That's the modern philosophy. Um, and Hume says, so like I mean, it's a little bit of a weirdness about this. But it doesn't really produce a transition between the ancient and the modern philosophy. Um, um, but, like, I think he's thinking, and this is certainly what he represents the modern philosophers themselves as saying that if you don't just let the imagination go, then you have to stop and try to think carefully, okay, what kind of properties could this external object have? And when you do that, you're gonna end up with the modern philosophy. So, so like, this isn't so much a development of ancient philosophy, it's like, this is what, this is what you naturally land in once you clear your mind of this delusion. Um, but again, he thinks it's going to turn out to be inconsistent. So, um, so it starts on, this is the way Hume understands it. It starts with an argument for the ideality of the secondary qualities, right? For the fact that secondary qualities are properties of ideas or impressions, not properties of external objects. Um, and it's pretty similar to what, to the argument against the vulgar view. So similar that I get all like confused about them. But it works like this. The, 
the same object without obviously changing can give rise to impressions of different sensible qualities. Right, so like Locke's example is, um, I put both hands in the same water at the same time, and it feels warm to one hand and cold to the other, right? Because of what where the hands were before. You know? So, uh, right, like one hand I move from warm water, and one more hand I move from, move from cold water, and I put them in this water at the same time. That's an intermediate temperature, and this one feels cold because it was in warm water, and this one, uh, anyway. So, <laughs> more more detail than I need to give. But right, so I put two hands in the same water at the same time, feels cold to one, warm to the other. And um, um, Hume says, well, um, it's impossible for it to really have different sensible qualities. Or Hume, that is, this is the argument for the ideality of secondary qualities that Hume is putting in the mouth of the modern philosophers. That's promising because Locke does mention the two hands <laughs> when he makes this argument, right? So, 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 the, so the first step is the same object um, uh, gives rise to impressions of different sensible qualities. The second step is it's impossible for it to really have different sensible qualities. It's just the same object. And the third step is, therefore, some impressions don't resemble any quality in their object, right? Because, you know, like here we have it in water, gave rise to these two impressions, hot impression and a cold impression. It can't be both hot and cold. So one of these doesn't resemble any quality in the water. At most, one of them resembles it, right? So like the hot one could resemble it if the water really is hot. Or the cold one could resemble it if the water really is cold, but they can't both represent it. So there are some impressions that can't both resemble it. So there are some impressions that don't resemble their object. And then the fourth step, again, from like effects, we presume like causes. That's on page 276. From like effects, we presume like causes. Um, you know, in more respect of these like. They're both impressions that we got when we put our hands in the water. <laughs> um, one of them isn't like weaker than the other um, or anything. They're just they're two equally strong impressions that I got by doing exactly the same thing to the water with two different hands. So these are like effects. And for like effects, we presume like causes. And at least one of these doesn't resemble anything in the body. Therefore, no impressions resemble anything at all. No impressions of hot and cold. Right? There was what you're trying to have an argument for secondary qualities specifically. You have to say that this doesn't happen with primary qualities. Right? Like Barclay responding to the same type of example said that that happens with primary qualities too. That the, that the same thing can look square from you know one place and round from another. Um, and then I said, well, but Locke is probably thinking about tangible primary qualities. Hume doesn't bring that up that objection. Um, I think like he doesn't have to get into that. Right? At some point he says, I believe that many objections could be brought to this view. So he's not going to go into all the possible objections to this view because there's one that he thinks is completely decisive and shows that it couldn't possibly be true because it's not self-consistent. So he takes this argument to be good. He like he doesn't raise the question of whether you can make the same argument about the primary qualities, 
So he leaves the modern philosophers that is locked with the view that the external object has primary qualities, that is, has qualities that resemble our ideas of primary qualities, or that it resembles our ideas with respect to primary qualities and not with respect to secondary qualities, right? So our ideas of bodies have size and shape and motion and whatever, and the objects of our ideas resemble them in those respects, although they're not exactly the same necessarily, but they resemble them in those respects. This is the same thing you remember from book two, right, where he said that like the grain of sand resembles our, right. So, you know, so, but but now we're saying with the modern philosophers, that's only with, in, with respect to the primary qualities. On the other hand, our ideas also have a color, but there's nothing that resembles that in the external object. So then he says, okay, well, let's look at the primary qualities. So first of all, we have, well, first of all, we have emotion. Why does it start with emotion? Why not pay attention to the That is the way it starts. All right. So, um, so motion, first of all, it says it's clear that motion is not conceivable without something moved. Why is that clear? So, like, isn't that an example of a necessary connection between ideas? Right, if we can see that motion couldn't exist without extension and figure. So um, I think the reason is, so here doesn't say this any place in this section, but it, 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 it seems to fit what he's saying so well that I think he's thinking it, which is that um, these inconceivabilities are all examples of something he said a long time ago, namely that the negative can't be conceived without the positive. Um, so um, that is, there has to be something specific that it's not. And motion, remember, he said in the part about the vacuum, he said that motion is basically the same. You were just reading this, that motion is the same as um, annihilation and creation. Right? So, what motion basically means is that this thing is not where it was, but somewhere else. And there has to be something that it's not. <laughs> Right, that is the concept of annihilation makes no sense without the concept of something that's annihilated. Because motion basically involves annihilation. The same thing is true of motion. So it's not really like a separate idea that we see necessarily goes with some others. It's just the general fact that they, that um, Negation is only makes sense as negation of something. So extension and figure. Now, I mean, I, I think you could say something similar about these. Um, the extension, I mean, I think it would be why, by way of the fact that extension involves division into parts and figure involves limitation. Um, but, you know, Hume doesn't, what Hume says at this point is just that 
We already proved that. We already proved before that extension and figure can't exist on their own without color or fluidity. I think actually, like if you look into the details of, of that proof, oh, but I'm out of time, so I won't. <laughs> so never mind. So extension can't ex extension and figure can't exist without color or solidity. But color is a secondary property. So that leaves only solidity. So it turns out that um, the one idea we, the one property that we need to understand how external things can have absolutely, so to speak, is solidity. But then he asks, well, what is solidity? Well, solidity means that Hume says that this body um, can't get into the space that's taken up by that body. Right? That was Locke's definition of solidity. But what can get into what? Right? Solidity means that something can't get into something. What? Not just extension and figure, because extension and figure can't exist on their own. But not solidity, because we're trying to explain what solidity is. That would be a circle. So it says, well, it could be color. Right? So solidity would mean that this color can't penetrate into this color. The color is a secondary color. So there's nothing we so like there's nothing we can conceive an external object as being. These properties only all only make sense if we assume some other property, right? Like something has to be moving, something has to be extended and shaped, something has to be solid. Um, and but there's no absolute property to fill in there, and so we're not really thinking of anything, and that's the incoherence, right? Like when we try to explain that our belief is that there is an external object in addition to our impression, but when we try to explain what it is, we find we're talking about nothing, we don't know any properties that we're talking about. Okay, there's more to say about that, but I've already gone over. Sorry about that. And I will see you on Thursday.